Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery. We're here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions and other addiction-related mental health challenges. In this show, we dive into the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual aspects of addiction, mental health, recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. You can listen on your favorite app or at jodystevens.org. Genuine Life Recovery is made possible by great friends like Joshua's Heart in memory of Joshua Brent Moore, bringing hope, love, and awareness to those afflicted by addiction online at joshesheart.org and Jody Stevens Productions for commercial voiceover, narration, production, MC, and public speaking online at jodystevens.org. Hey friends, welcome back. How to stop feeling powerless over addiction, over sin, over life controlling habits. That is what I'm gonna be talking about in this episode. So uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for hanging out. Right now, uh, as I record this episode, I am in Reno, Nevada. My husband and I also live part-time right now between Reno and Oregon. So we're back in Reno, our main place, our main home, and uh, just took care of a lot of health stuff. You know, all that fun stuff. You go, you get all your blood work done, go see the doctor. In this case, we both got colonoscopies. Super fun, right? <laughs> Actually, the uh, the colonoscopy itself is super easy because, you know, they just knock you out. It's all the it's all the fun prep. Anyway, if you've had one, obviously I don't need to go into the details. If you have not had one, honestly, it's not a big deal. It's really not a big deal. Everybody acts like, oh, colonoscopy. It's totally not a big deal. Uh, so anyway, hey, I would love it if you would share this program with anyone that you know struggling with addictions, mental health challenges, things like that. Leave a review on iTunes. Um, that would be awesome. So here's a quote from me. Everything good is for God's glory. And so is everything bad. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a little story as I get into this concept of overcoming, of admitting powerlessness to get power back, right? It's this paradox of powerlessness. What does that mean? Okay. So I drank like an alcoholic for years. I did this in my teens up until my early thirties. I used marijuana daily too, dabbled in other drugs, but those were my main two. Toward the end of my addiction, I tried a lot of methods to stop unsuccessfully. So, you know, it wasn't just the, the drugs and the alcohol. I was powerless to quit. In fact, they were just Band-Aids. I also could not control my anger, my rage. I couldn't figure out how to get a handle on my anxiety. I had panic attacks. I had low self-esteem. Now, you could say that all those emotional issues I just mentioned were the underlying cause of my addiction, but the fact remained that none of those things were ever going to get better while I was in my addiction, right? Because when we're using food or gambling or sex or drugs or alcohol, we're not dealing with the underlying issues, right? And we're continuing to sort of stunt our growth emotionally. So I tried to quit a lot on my own, and I pleaded with God to take away my addiction. The problem is that it was the only way that I knew how to cope with my emotional turmoil. And of course, the, the alcohol did make me feel better in the moment, right? So I did what most people do. I tried to bargain with my addiction. And so one attempt went something like this. <laughs> and I've talked about this in other episodes as well. I'm sitting in my apartment at the time I was in my, let's see how, I, or I was in my early 30s, right? And I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to quit drinking. So I decided, I came up with this brilliant idea. I said, Lord, if you will strike me sober, I will throw away all my heavy metal CDs, right? This is a brilliant idea. So this is how the conversation with God went. This was 18 years ago. I'm dating myself when I desperately wanted to quit drinking. 
So there I was, I'm in my, my little apartment. And mind you, I'm working at a Christian music station at the time, The Fish in Sacramento. I'm playing praise and worship music and I'm getting drunk every night and I'm doing this bargaining thing with God, okay? so But here he was, he's with me the whole time, right? So I'm filling these big, black, heavy-duty trash bags with, you know, Danzig and Dio and Wasp and you've probably never heard of any of those. Alice Cooper, everybody knows Alice Co- Cooper, you know, Queensryche, uh, the, the Grim Reaper, Zodiac Mind Warp, and the Tattooed Beat Messiah. Yeah, they were an actual band. <laughs> Believe it or not, they were pretty good. Um, so I sling these bags up and over my shoulder. I hurl them into the dumpster, right, with this this force, this confidence, you know, this air of victory. Because I really think, I, I think this is going to work, right? So then I go inside and I'm waiting, right? I'm waiting for the magic to happen, right? God's just going to, he's going to take away my urge to drink and, you know, everything's everything's going to be fine. I was drunk again the next night. I'm like, God, what happened? God, I thought we had a deal. God, I'm still drinking and now all my music is gone. Just in case the garbage man decided to skip our apartment that week, I went out and looked. Yep, gone. Uh, I know some of you are laughing. You're laughing with me, but some of you are laughing because you've done something like this. Come on. You have, you've bargained, you've done it. And God appreciates it. I mean, I'm sure he appreciated my heart. That was, some of that music was really demonic, particularly Danzig, and I needed to get it out of my house. Um, And, you know, that was was true. But I'm sure that he, you know, appreciated my heart, ridding my place of all that, you know, devil music. However, it was hardly a path to sobriety, Right. I wanted the easy way out. I wanted God to pull out his magic wand. I wanted him to fix my problem so that I didn't have to do the work that it takes to recover. But the hard stuff is what I had to do. And now I've been sober for 18 years. And I can tell you, friends, I do not miss the alcohol. I do not miss the drugs. Sometimes I miss my CDs, though. (laughs) But I would like to note that Alice Cooper and Blackie Lawless, who is the lead singer of Wasp, are both born-again Christians. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, my life had to get a little uglier before I summoned the courage to do those things like call a sponsor and get sober. And, you know, I went through Alcoholics Anonymous. I went through the 12 Steps. Um, you know, I had to do all those things. And listen, anything worth having is worth fighting for. And anything worth having is going to take some work. And when it comes to addiction, there isn't usually a, a super quick fix or easy way out. You know, everyone in my family that didn't stop drinking, unfortunately, is dead, including my brother who died of his addiction in 2015. You know, um, and so it's not uh, something that God, God does magic wand people like that sometimes, but a lot of times it just doesn't work that way. And, you know, that day God showed me that the only way out is through, that I had to get through this and work through this. And if you think about it, I mean, what kind of a, a testimony would I have if, if God would have granted that? You know, how would I have been able to help people? Imagine me today like, hey, everybody, it was really easy. You know, I just prayed and God took it away the end, you know. And again, sometimes that happens. It's pretty rare. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I I wish that, that God would do the magic wand thing more often. But, you know, a lot of people who experience that kind of recovery, a lot of times they're pretty immature, right? Because they haven't done that hard emotional and spiritual work to understand why they were drinking or using in the first place. So, you know, because addiction is a Band-Aid and and we use it to cover emotional pain a lot of times, usually to soothe anxiety, things like that, is often where these addictions and life-controlling habits come from. So 
When I say recovery, I mean recovery not just from the obvious things like alcohol or drugs, but from anger, from control, from manipulation, food, gambling, insert that thing. So let me relate this to the 12-step model just for a minute. Okay, step one of the 12 steps says, and this is for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable, right? So the first part in surrendering to God to regaining control of our lives back is admitting like we don't have control. So that's the paradox. But now listen to this Narcotics Anonymous admitted we were powerless over drugs or our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. So if we're in Celebrate Recovery, we may say something like, admitted we were powerless over anger or lust or food or other people, which is, in that case, codependency, that our lives had become unmanageable. So what I like to say is this, admitted we were powerless over sin that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, this in in no way is designed to like heap shame on you. I, I don't believe that addictions are simply the cause of a moral failure. A lot of times they are birthed out of childhood trauma and attachment disorders and underlying mental health issues and other things that really are just beyond our control or personality disorders and, and stuff like that. But so that's part of it. Right, But if you look at the original sin model, we see that the Bible tells us that all of creation is groaning under the power of sin. So it doesn't say that specifically, but it says that in so many words. This means that everything is corrupt in one way or another, even our biology. This means the entire world is in this quandary. And Romans talks about this. It says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to son for our adoption to sonship or daughtership, right? The redemption of our bodies. So our bodies are still under this fall of sin. We're still caught in the mechanisms of this world that that cause us to want to reach for those um, those fake the things, those substitutes to uh, ease our pain. Okay, and everybody's got something. So can you see how substituting the word sin for this step one, this powerlessness, pretty much puts it into perspective? Because again, everybody's got something that they can't manage by themselves. And the Bible shows us over and over that this is in fact true, (laughs) right? Because when we study it, we see the depravity of the human condition run on self-will. And this is why we need Jesus Christ as our Savior, because no one else overcame sin for us and has the power to heal us in this life, and no one else has the power to give us eternal life in the next. 1 Corinthians tells us the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, Jesus, right, a life-giving spirit, the first man, dust of the earth, the second man, Jesus, heaven, from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, right? That's us. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven, right? When we surrender to the Lord, we get the Holy Spirit, we become of heaven, right? And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. So, As long as we are running on our own self-will, right, we're going to be constantly fighting against these things, against the enemies of our soul. And those enemies are the world, the flesh, the devil, 
right? So the world is all, you know, the fame, the fortune, all the things that we want, the cars, the money, the flesh is very important to this show <laughs> of recovery because the, the flesh is the, the addictions and the things that we reach for, right? We need to crucify our flesh to starve those things, right? But we need a replacement, and, and I'll get into that, right? And then the devil, right? That's typically, you know, obviously, um, and this could be, you know, a whole nother show, which I plan to do, but sometimes it is the devil. Now you could say that it's always the devil, right? If we look at original sin, but remember, if all of creation is groaning, then we have natural things that are going on. We have natural causes. We have biological causes. We have psychological causes. Then we do have demonic oppression, right? So sometimes it's... So the the important thing is to assess whether it's one or the other, both, all three, right? But any, anyway, I digress. But those are the things that we are up against uh, in the world, and so surrendering to God, surrendering to that life-giving spirit, the Holy Spirit, is where real healing and deliverance can begin. So it's not so much our, our difficult feelings that are the problem and our struggles that are the problem as it is our constant fight to avoid them. Jesus said, you will have trouble in this life, but take heart, I've overcome the world. We don't want to feel sad, so we drink. But maybe we need to feel sad, evaluate the sadness, decide if it's useful, and then move on toward the life we want, okay? So when we, when left to our own devices to soothe ourselves, right, the hurts, the habits and hang-ups, things like that, we often end up trapped up, you know, trapped in this cycle of addiction, and it's really like pain management because we don't want to deal with the pain. Um, the book Serenity, a companion for the 12-step recovery, describes the cycle of addiction as follows. So first we have the pain, right? Then we reach out to the addictive agent, the food, the work. for a workaholic. The alcohol is, in my case, the drugs, the sex, the gambling, right? So, you know, the dependent relationship, codependency, right? We do this to solve our pain. Number three, then we have temporary anesthesia, anesthesia, right? We're, you know, we're there, we're in our, we're, we're feeling, we're feeling good. We're feeling this temporary relief, right? And then number four, we have negative consequences. So maybe we get a DUI, we get a sexually transmitted disease, our spouse is mad at us for spending all the money, right? Then we have the shame and the guilt, which result in more pain, low self-esteem, and then the cycle starts again. So admitting powerlessness and self-defeat is how we have to break this cycle. God, I can't do it. God, I'm done. Help me. Show me what to do. I, I just, I give this all to you. Help me. I'm not going to bargain with my heavy metal CDs. Just help me, right? Um, right? So this is what opens the door to life transformation and victory through recovery. We allow ourselves to yield to a greater power, which is the power of God through Jesus Christ. And the reason we need a power greater than ourselves to give up our addictions is because the longer we give into them, the more they dominate our lives until they become more powerful than our ability to manage them, right? So this is the whole concept of living in the flesh or living in the spirit, right? You have to kind of crucify the flesh. And the more we obey the spirit, the more we live in the spirit. So people are like, how do you feel the spirit? How do you feel God's spirit? How do you do it? through obedience, right? You have to walk it out. And it's hard. You have to kind of, you know, you have to starve the flesh. Right? But again, we need the replacement, and I'll talk about that. But so, so in addition, this is the reason trying to quit is so challenging, because these things, they do provide some measure of temporary comfort. They provide relief. They provide power in some cases, right? I mean, anger can level the playing field, so to speak. If I start yelling and raging, which I used to do, it shuts everybody down, 
right? They're like, I'm out of here, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, I'm done. You know, drinking can make me feel better in the moment. It can provide a short uh, respite for, for what I lack the courage to do, right? Things like dealing with difficult emotions, things like talking to my boss, whatever it is, right? And then unfortunately, right, you wake up the next day, I still have those emotions. The problem with my boss is still there. And now I'm hungover, so I feel even worse. And the cycle continues. But think of this, you know, if, if anger or drugs or drinking or the like are the only coping strategies we know, it makes it almost impossible to give them up. So this recovery journey is a process, right? We admit the powerlessness, but then we need some help. Right? The Bible talks about renewing our mind and walking it out and, and doing different things. You know, if we experience childhood trauma and we start drinking to deal with the fear, the shame, the difficult emotions, giving up alcohol or whatever it is, it feels like giving up our only lifeline for survival. This is what makes it so challenging. Like, why can't they just stop, you know? And it feels that way to us, even though everybody else can see how destructive the addiction is. And this is why it's so important to get help to learn new coping strategies. You know, the Bible gives us clear instructions for living, and God will put people in our lives who can help us too. And there's a lot of great therapeutic techniques and stuff, you know, to do this that that gel perfectly with Christianity. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy is, you know, changing your thoughts to change your actions. And, you know, the Bible talks about renewing your mind, you know. Um, so a good counselor, a good sponsor, a, a mentor, a coach can help you recognize your, your triggers, right? Things that cause you to fall into these negative life patterns and to develop healthier coping strategies. You know, I have my MS and addiction counseling, and I can offer tools and support for those struggling with, um, you know, addictions and life controlling habits. But since God created us, he's the only one who truly understands our condition, and he is eager for us to surrender our will to him. In Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus saw the multitudes, it says he was moved with compassion for them. He was moved because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. That's how we are in this world without God. We don't know it, right? We don't know we see it. But God is moved with compassion for you. So compassion isn't just sympathy or empathy, although it can have those pieces to it. But compassion is action. It's when God is moved with Compassion, this means that he is actively involved in alleviating our suffering. Sometimes we have to suffer. Sometimes that's good for us, but, you, but it's, it's for our good in the long run. He's actively involved in getting us to where he wants us to be victorious. And yes, sometimes that can involve some suffering, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and this is why surrendering to him and allowing him to do his work is so important. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So when we turn toward God, we admit we are powerless over our addictions or life-controlling habits. We're going to be able to stop avoiding the pain and come to terms with it. We're going to be able to break that cycle of addiction. And we're going to feel the Holy Spirit guide us in the way we should go as we continue to obey. And God will provide us with the help we need along the way. So I hope this was helpful to you. I hope this whole paradox of what does it mean to surrender and give up power, to get power back. It's God that gives us that power. I hope that makes sense now. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for listening. Again, please share this program with anyone you know who could uh, benefit from it. Also, I'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or whatever app you're listening through. You can hear this show on iTunes or Spotify or Amazon Alexa. Also on my website at jodystevens.org. Just click podcast. And of course, I'm always looking for great guests if you have a story of overcoming feel free to reach out to me. My email is genuinelife at jodystevens.org. So thank you so much for listening, friends, and we will talk to you next time. 
Thank you so much, friends, for listening to Genuine Life Recovery, playing on your favorite app or on my website at jodystevens.org. It's J-O-D-I-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, jodystevens.org. There you can check out my podcast, blog, recovery coaching info, speaking, and more. Check it out.